very, very welcome to the Nordic Animism channel, to uh, the Irish genius filmmaker Tom Moore. Uh, I'm uh, a little bit starstruck and very happy to uh, to have you here and uh, have a chance to uh, have a talk to you about about your work. Thanks very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And to all the viewers, I hope that I've been giving you homework and that before you watch this, that you've actually watched some of uh, uh, Tom's movies, perhaps Song of the Sea or some of the other ones. So... Uh, Yes, I'm very happy to have you here. Um, yes, I'm a huge fan of your uh, of your uh, movies, and I am quite sure that a lot of my followers would probably also be. Uh, just this morning, I spoke to a guy who was like, "What? You're talking to Tom Moore today? Wow!" Um, so uh, I'm a little bit interested in in if you have any thoughts about animism in 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 general or in how how you relate how you see that in relation to your work um if it's something you you even i don't know no, no, it's a thing I, became really, I became really aware of when i was researching my first uh movie the secret of kells and i was looking a lot at the i think they call it syncretism or anyway whenever a new religion comes in and kind of absorbs the previous religion and i found it fascinating to see how much of like irish the irish version of of catholicism even had so many echoes of an earlier belief system. And I was really fascinated by even some of our saints having been gods and goddesses prior to that. And so when I looked into that, I knew we needed to represent that worldview in the movie. And so we had this character, Ashling, And she's kind of, Ashling means a dream or a vision in Gaelic. And there's a tradition of, of poems in Irish um, and in the Irish tradition of an, of an Ashling poem where Ireland itself pr presents itself as a young woman to the poet. And so looking into that, I ended up delving even deeper and going into the, the old annals and the old mythology and the earliest ideas of where Ireland and Irish people came from. And there's a really old poem and it's called, I think, The Song of Tuan McCarroll. And he was a character who lived through many ages. And I kind of gave that to Ashling. And so Ashling in Secret of Kells is like this animist sort of spirit running through Irish history. She's sometimes a wolf, sometimes a deer, sometimes a salmon. And in the old um, stories that we were looking at, that character is also an eagle and at different times is, is represented in different creatures at different eras of Irish history. So we kind of wanted to make her this kind of ancient spirit of the country that the little monk was interacting with to kind of show that that worldview and that belief system also influenced the artwork that's remember today in the book of Kells and so on you know mm -hmm. yeah it was oh. sort of interesting worldview I guess the other thing about animism I remember the first time I came across the word was because I was a fan of Miyazaki and I was thinking about Japanese animism and I started to realize that there was something like that in Irish folklore and folk belief that like every place had a name that meant something and there was always a belief of a spirit in everything like a river, mountain, etc., there was this kind of animist worldview sitting alongside Christianity, which is quite interesting too. Hmm. No, I think it's it's a very interesting topic, and though I don't know a lot about it, my impression is particularly in Ireland this syncretic thing that happens with with uh, uh, with a meeting between uh, Catholicism and and uh, pre-Christian uh, beliefs. Yeah. My impression is that that. Uh, what also happens is a cultural resilience that manifests. This happens in, in Scandinavia, I know at least. Uh, but uh, my impression is that in Ireland you have it much more present because it's it it uh, the uh, the country stayed Catholic, and Catholic Catholicism has in some ways been uh, <clears throat> been a little bit less disruptive actually to animist realities. Um, I spoke to. And there was some bad things too. I mean, there was some, I mean, the church in Ireland has a, a kind of a terrible history as well, but even almost pre-Catholic, I read in a really fascinating book called The Falcon's Claw, and it was, there's these little islands on the on the west coast of Ireland um, called the Skelligs. And if you ever watched the Star Wars movies, that's where Luke Skywalker is hiding in the, the new movies, you know, but they're really impressive. And the book is a letters from the abbot of the Skelligs to the Pope in Rome. And it kind of describes the difference between 
the Irish worldview and the rest of Europe at the time. And it's why a lot of these stories were preserved. A lot of the monks wrote down those myths and wrote down those um, stories and they kind of preserved them. Even if they were a bit disparaging of them, they saw some value in preserving them. And that's how some of them got remembered. Because prior to that, they were just an oral tradition, you know. Okay, yeah. Wow. No, and also the like uh, uh, in the in the movie The Secret of Kells, uh as I recall it, there is this feeling that Ashling is communicating really the beauty of nature to this young monk and and these kind of explosions of butterflies and 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 beings uh is then uh basically manifested in the in the uh this illuminated work uh yeah. that and and in 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 the Cairo page and and, and these yeah things. exactly and on the other side we had Crum Crook who's a kind of a a pagan deity that was um there was sacrifice human sacrifices made in pre um christian times and we kind of wanted him to represent almost the snake you know the legend of saint patrick banishing the snake from ireland but he actually just becomes brendan's fears it becomes a real classic hero's journey kind of trope because basically from crook is what brendan has to face in himself you know because i think that there's always this kind of truth in those old stories and that's what you usually go hunting for something that resonates That's why the stories survive, I think. And that was something that we wanted to, almost the journey of a young artist, you know, that he was inspired by all the nature and Ashling represented that awe and wonder. And in the underworld, the crumb was fear of not being good enough or not being able to do it. And he had to defeat that in order to communicate his inspiration, you know. Yeah. yeah. The Secret of Kells, uh, uh, I also find it almost... Or I, I I don't know the actual history of, around the Book of Kells, but I found it to almost be like a mythic exploration of that somehow like mind blowing thing. Then under these very violent Viking attacks, and what do people do? They they sit and they create incredible works of of beauty and art like it yeah. th there's something weirdly sort of uh contradict that at such a violent and harsh time that then it was a harsh time the... it was harsh time it was a difficult time and it was coming from every side and i also had done a lot of research into why that was going on and the pressure that was you know charlemagne and the sort of holy roman empire expanding up to scandinavia caused those viking attacks but something that i don't think we were um able to communicate which was really subtle the vikings just became more like a symbol of kind of darkness um actually when you look at the art from that time there's actually cross pollination you see viking designs in the book of kells and you see sort of quote unquote celtic or irish designs in in Icelandic stuff. You know, it's really interesting that it was actually quite a melting pot of a time, but we were kind of telling a fable from the point of view of a little boy living in... North yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and of course, like, th there's also an aspect of... Uh, like, when I saw it, uh, of course, the these these Viking figures that are almost like demons, yeah. it, it it appears very inside the uh, the um, Irish mythology of... Is it called Loch, Loch Lanath or something like that? Loch Lan where yeah. there's this idea of sea demons that that, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. that there's yeah. almost that kind of feeling feeling to right. it but of course historically things look all kinds of complex really and what also happened was that and high burn or norse culture actually emerged and and all yeah. that stuff so, waterford and everything yeah it's really interesting yeah yeah cool um <clears throat> Uh, well, now we just docked our, straight into to uh, to the secret of Kells here. Uh, but I wonder if you can you can tell us a little bit more about uh, like your your other sources of inspiration in your in for your your movies. Yeah, I mean, once I was researching Secret of Kells, I knew there was almost a life's work in that stuff, and I also knew that. I met a storyteller called Eddie Lenehan, and he was, he is an amazing, like a shanky, it's like an old storyteller in Ireland. And he kind of was the one who kind of told me that they were our stories to retell, and that every storyteller can tell the same story, but it'll be different every time. Depends on the audience and the storyteller. So I felt like I was getting an opportunity to tell these stories in a, with a broad palette to an audience of maybe young people, not just in Ireland, internationally. But I also was aware it was just my take on them. So for each each thing that I discovered, like the while I was working on Secret of Kells, I read a book called The People of the Sea, which was about the 
Selkie stories in Scotland and Ireland. And then those stories were really inspiring and really interesting. And I felt they spoke to a certain grief, a certain way of dealing with grief, you know. But then I discovered that those stories are up in the Scandinavian countries, even in Canada. There's this, uh, um, a salmon print story from Canada. So it's very interesting that there's the people who lived so close to the sea had a way of seeing the fellow travelers, their fellow, their fellow fisher people as also people, uh, you know, animals could also be seen as having like souls. And I thought that was really interesting um, because when I when I first got the idea for, sea, or for Song of the Sea, I was on holidays in the west of Ireland and fit, local fishermen had been killing seals and it was quite disturbing to see the seals' bodies. And a, a woman, a local woman told me that that wouldn't have happened in the old times because there was disrespect. Um, and, and, and I kind of realized that we were losing a connection when we lost those beliefs, when we lost that sense of connection to the environment, we were losing more than just the stories. You know, the stories were becoming kind of cute things for tourists and stuff, but there was a loss of enchantment with nature and with the world. And I thought those stories needed to be preserved. So it was the same with Wolf Walkers too. We kind of went on a shopping trip. There's so many stories to go through. And I knew I wanted to make three movies. So Song of the Sea was dealing with the Selkies and dealing with even in a broader sense, that movie deals with the loss of stories and songs and beliefs. And then Wolf Walkers was kind of the town I grew up in, Kilkenny. We had um, these local kind of werewolf stories that were called the Wolves of Ossery. And, and those stories were also linking back to the time of St. Patrick, when apparently there was pagans who wouldn't convert and they would disrupt his sermons by howling in the woods like wolves. So he put a curse on them or a blessing. That's the interesting thing that they would become wolves when they slept. And so they weren't werewolf monsters. They were these kind of in-between people that were like the pagans between the, the, the new civilized world of man and the old world that was closer to nature. And so we wanted to kind of talk about that and really bring those stories back into the consciousness, you know, for another generation. And maybe the next generation will interpret them in, in video games or who knows what, but it, you're just a, you're just a kind of, uh, uh, it's like a relay race as a storyteller. You you get a chance to retell them, and then you hope that you tell it well enough that it'll be retold again by the next generation. You know. Mm. No, I, I I think it's it's an absolutely fascinating take that you have both in uh, the Song of the Sea and in Wolf Walkers, where where like as I as I see these movies, you are actually connecting to some really deep uh, aspects of the original stories, which is that um, perhaps werewolves aren't just scary enemy enemies, right? Perhaps we're supposed to be werewolves sometimes. If if we look, for instance, at at our side of the pond, we we find positive stories about people turning into wolves. The uh, the the Volsungar story are talking about people turning into wolves. That's also a little bit of a scary story, actually. But you also have stuff like uh, ritual communities of people who would ceremonially turn into wolf in in f for military purposes uh and s which which is kind of you find that sometimes around in, in play different places in the world you find native american cheyenne dog soldiers perhaps or uh, uh mesoamerican indigenous leopard no a jaguar soldiers yeah. and these kind of things so there's that idea that that humans can can turn yeah. to to uh, to um, uh, uh, animals, or that rather that the lines between what's human and what animals, those lines can be very much blurred. Yeah. Uh, that, that's to me as well because I feel like you know I'm I'm a, really an advocate for animal rights, and I feel like we've lost contact with um, you know with factory farming and everything. I think we've really lost contact with the fact that we are animals, and we try to. Cons and when you look at those ancient worlds, people lived in much closer contact with animals and they had concepts like an honorable harvest where they didn't take too much and they left some for the other, you know, top predators. And there was a kind of a, a respect between humans and, and wolves and bears and those kind of other, you know, I mean, even in Native American culture, they often refer to them as brothers and sisters, you know. 
Yeah. And you, yeah, that you actually also find in Northern Europe sometimes that uh, particularly you'll find it with bears. If you go north into Scandinavia, <clears throat> you find that that both Finnish, Swedish and, and Sami people will sometimes talk about bears with uh, fa- familiar terms. They will call them uncles and, uh, you know, kinship. Uh, yeah. So I'm and- so fascinated by that, actually. I want to do more research into it, maybe to write some um uh, perhaps uh, things from secret accounts like maybe there's a viking project in me i'm not sure <laughs> well if you uh if you want ideas then yeah. i'm 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 a, i'm an idea gatling gun we can uh, uh, i can ping pong ideas with you sometime for sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so sure. i think yeah. wolf walkers has a lot of potential because we kind of invented a mythology there that <clears throat> In theory stretches back to about 500 you know mm. if we, we take saint patrick as the starting point yeah. and so there's plenty of opportunities for um wolf walkers to encounter people from those northern cultures and to see yeah that's interesting sure so, yeah we <clears throat> we also have a, a mythology uh about people turning into ravens in yeah. this part where in mythology you see De- deities actually also even in irish mythology deities that can sometimes have raven form and and humans yeah, yeah. exactly yeah and odin and these these are related to ideas of human shamans that can turn into ravens uh but then what you see with christianity is that this becomes uh dark and horror like it becomes uh a curse where where this human cursed to live in raven form will then have to uh, drink the blood of an unborn child or similar very scary thing in order to uh, lift the curse so there's a similar uh thing as we see with a werewolf i think it's really interesting the other thing i thought with the traditional werewolf legends they often seem to have a a connotation that wildness was something to be tamed rather than something that was just part of us and that is almost like i remember reading george monbiot talking a lot about environmentalism and um rewilding and rediscovering wilderness and appreciating wilderness and you know the tragedy of the mowed lawn and all of this kind of stuff and that wildness actually is an important part of us and it's funny how um those old stories kind of got twisted by another worldview and now we can rediscover their original meaning which i think is quite exciting yeah exactly exactly and, and like <laughs> if I'm, I'm just about to give you a little bit more fan mail mate and when that is narrated in grand like price winning movies like that uh like the ones you do then that is what actually really reaches people like i see a lot of for instance communications about that that sometimes use ancient mythologies but which for instance, there are uh, mythologies about the Ragnarok today, uh, and that's a very active myth because we are facing some kind of climate collapse. Yeah. But instead of having the original um, motivation of the story, which is connectivity between different forces in the world, between perhaps forces of order and and forces that are outside the human field, instead of having that as the purpose, they actually talk about it as an as an uh, confrontation that's supposed to be there which almost enforces the problem you know mm-hmm. so that is the way you sometimes see these stories narrated which i i feel that it's almost um it's almost we- it, it, sometimes it can almost be weaponizing mythology yeah, in, in a dangerous story. way yeah stories are really powerful and those old ancient stories carry a weight of kind of um sense that there are ancestors wisdom and when we tell them and don't forget the thing eddie told me eddie lenin that like you know when you tell the story it's it's a new story every time because it's a new audience a new storyteller we have to be conscious as storytellers that we we look for the hope in them or we look for the the the, the part the truth that resonates for today in those old <laughs> stories i I read this great book called braiding sweetgrass i was telling you i'm researching a movie at the moment about the connection between irish and native american indians and She's a Native American woman and a biologist, and she writes about re-enchantment. And it really spoke to me, this idea that we need to become re-enchanted. Oh, you have it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that book. Yeah, so Robin Wall Kimmerer. Yeah, and that was really inspirational for me because I was getting quite... My granddaughter was born five years ago, and I just started to become really depressed about the idea that when she was 40... I was 40 at the time. When she was 40, what was the world going to look like, you know? And there's a lot of 
doom and gloom and it's easy to become quite depressed you know and books like Braiding Sweetgrass really kind of helped me see that I had a role as a storyteller to help us reimagine our relationship with nature in taking inspiration from those ancient ways and actually more recently I went to a gathering of Cree people from Canada who came to Dublin and they were encouraging us to go back to our old our own indigeneity as they called it like our old beliefs about the land and nature um to discover how we can find solutions to the mm-hmm. climate crisis which I thought was beautiful you know yes yeah totally and I like this encouragement that you often see today from indigenous groups towards us you know potato color uh, majority populations I think it's a major um kind of macro cultural dialogue that's playing out that they are saying to us please you know think about yourself in indigenous ways or how they formulate it and then we are in a struggle to figure out how to do that and what that is going to mean uh even more powerful is robin wall kimmerer turning on its head this kind of current um um important realization of settler culture and colonization but also saying and even those people who are like descendants of colonizers and settlers can become indigenous to place she talks about encouraging people to become indigenous to place rather than shaming people um for the, the maybe the sins of the past maybe look even further back to your own um Uh, historical belief systems to find a way to become indigenous to place, which I thought was a beautiful and open heart um, message from a Native American person. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've uh, very, um, I find uh, Robin Kimmerer's uh, work very inspirational. Uh, for instance, the honorable harvest. Uh, yeah. I am absolutely sure that you would find it in, in Ireland and you certainly find here these ideas that when you harvest when you literally go on the fields and harvest and the field where you harvest that becomes a sacred space people will put on their sunday best before they even go out and start harvesting other people cannot get into that space and then they leave some of that some of the actual crop they leave it in the field when they then take the crop home then that crop is treated as a deity as as a life-giving guest that is then greeted in a celebration when it arrives at the farm now these are honorable harvest principles that were there a couple of generations ago in mm-hmm. in uh, in normal you know north european yeah. populations we lost, we lost something over the years and it, it's it almost um the work is ongoing to 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 speak to what we lost and how it was taken and, and lost but also it's important to move beyond that sort of um um mea culpa thing yeah. and and to get to a place where we can find a sol- solutions and hope and you know because the kids that are being born today need that because we're facing into crazy difficult times yeah No, for sure, and I think that that uh, the idea, for instance, of guilt uh, is is not it's not a good thing to impose on uh, on humans. This individual yet cosmic guilt. I don't think it produces, for instance, ways of engaging land or ways of engaging cultural heritage that brings us further in a way that that you know produces a less destructive relation with the world I think the commonality is fascinating too like i keep finding more and more commonality between uh cultures and belief systems and they're really important to celebrate too i think you know mm. yeah yeah and i'm 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 finding that too because i'm looking a lot at folklore and and while you know reading uh, indigenous scholarship like robin kimmerer and and uh these people and you find it a lot like Recently, I found a uh, sacred fire, ways of producing sacred fire that has been current all over Northern Europe and uh, from Ireland going west, Scotland, England, all of Scandinavia going into the Baltics and 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 into Russia. There's been these very, very beautiful rituals of uh keeping fire sacred, uh, and they they have lived very far down in time like really close to our own time um yeah. i think it's rediscovering all of that and finding ways to integrate into our our modern world and 
Yeah. Um, that, that's, yeah. I mean, we could, yeah, the, all of that stuff has kind of, I didn't realize it at the time, but it became a thread running through all my movies, this kind of need to, um, yeah, reimagine our relationship to animals and nature and the environment um, yeah. through old beliefs, for sure. Yeah, yeah I uh, like in, in just to return a little bit to the song of the sea, like when I see that movie, I almost perceive it as kind of a, it's almost messianic in its sort of message of a return to an animist perception of the world. And I find that interesting because if you look at perhaps the surface level of s some of those stories of marriages with sea spirits, then most of them will have uh, what you describe a kind of a, a cataclysm uh, that results from the loss of the connectedness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just recently heard a story about an, an island in Sweden where there was a story of a man who had married a sea woman, a seal woman, then she had left him again, um, and he went out seal hunting. She had then visited him in the night and said, you, you're not allowed to kill that big seal there, because that's my husband. He sure. did it anyway, and then the whole island was cursed, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people had to die, basically, to to sort of pay back to, to the yeah. sea. See, these that is the most common mode Sometimes there are these other stories where perhaps the seal spirit becomes a protective spirit or something like that, or perhaps the rupture that has emerged from the human breaking the connection is healed. Mm. You, in, in northern Scandinavia, you have stories about how the, the, the marriage to a bear is then healed as the woman who got married to a bear prince and and um, okay. compromised this marriage. She has to travel on, in, in some adventure where she's basically recovering this marriage of uh and, and connectedness with the landscape uh yeah. being there so so and i like in the song of the sea i saw that that tendency that that there is a a marriage there's a rupture but then the story is really about reaching back towards that that yeah. uh, it's kind of like two threads that were there's just a very real modern family dealing with grief and that's going on and then on a bigger scale there was sort of it was a time with the celtic tiger in ireland and i was kind of feeling that we were also grieving a, a loss and trying to remember it and that's the message at the end that even if all the fairies and stuff are going back to wherever they go high brazil or tiernan og or whatever that she says to remember them in the stories and the songs and that was kind of the message of the movie that all of that knowledge is contained in those old stories because they're, even if they seem kind of harsh, they're always beautiful allegories. You know, they're always there's wisdom in the allegorical nature of them. You know, mm. they're not like happy Disney fairy tales. They always have a a, 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 a tense a tense um, reminder of our the fragile connections that we have. Yeah, I think it's really important. Yeah, it continues to be something that I'm passionate about, and I'm excited to see more and more people telling stories also from their own cultures. That's really exciting. Yeah, that's this true. You're, you're seeing also uh, uh, a production of um, indigenous uh, stories in in uh, um, in uh, animated movies today. Uh, yeah. Inuit or uh, different uh, that's great. Indigenous yeah, perspective. Great. It's absolutely amazing. Like uh, there's a Netflix series called Spirit Rangers, which is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, working with a writer from that show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a writer from that show working with us on our on our new movie, and she's a Choctaw writer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, my kids love it. My kids love it, and it's 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 an amazing aspect of our time that that kind of story is getting that level of exposure. I mean, I think they're needed. I think they're needed. Yeah, I think yeah. I think at some level the culture needs them, and we need to reimagine our all of that stuff and see it again for yeah for your kids and for that generation for sure yeah yeah and it's becoming available like when i was like a teenager or something like that you know like the availability for instance of indigenous voices in the international space was was almost non-existent and what was there was some some weird pastiche or something it wasn't uh, wasn't maybe real not, maybe sometimes well-meaning but a little bit um, in retrospect, um, you know, patronizing or something, some of that stuff. So yeah, yeah, to have people represent their own culture is really important, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I was a teenager, though, there was this thing that happened in Ireland in around the turn of the 20th century 
and then continued on. So I was born in 77. So I was just in time for this kind of Celtic mysticism revival. So we had artists like Jim Fitzpatrick doing these amazing illuminated books. But as a comics fan, he really spoke to me because he kind of presented those stories as beautifully ornate, decorated, but also kind of cool and sexy superheroes and heroines and stuff. And then, and then we had Clonid and Enya and a whole kind of uh, resurgence of Irish language music and traditional Irish music being reimagined. I remember there was a TV show, Robin of Sherwood, which I loved that Clonid, the music bar, and they had like the deer god in the forest and then. Um, and the hunter and it was just like all of that stuff mixed up and i love the dark crystal and and um the secret of nim by Dom. there was all these kind of just things with a tinge of this kind of stuff in the fantasy that all fed into me and my interest and then when i was in young irish filmmakers i was really lucky that in in young irish filmmakers like the artistic director mike kelly and then a guy called michael adelson from america would give us these lectures on how these stories, these more ancient stories were feeding modern pop culture and it really inspired me to do well, what I'm doing. And so sometimes people say that my movies are a bit dark for kids, but actually the movies and stuff I grew up on as a kid were much darker than like this. These days it's a lot of kind of, and that's fine, cute like minions and things like that. But back then when you look at the Dark Crystal or The Last Unicorn or The Never Ending Story, they had this kind of mythic um, sense to them. And so hopefully this generation of stuff like Spirit Rangers and all been inspired. And, you know, that's the, my thing as well. Like your yeah. kids and my granddaughter, like the, they, their generation will retell the stories. And hopefully if we feed them good stuff and not just distracting, you know, plastic toy commercials, they, they will be inspired to te- keep the stories alive yeah. and retell them and make them relevant to their generation, you know. Yeah, totally, totally. And I also think there's a, there is an, in, by, in my view, an improvement of the animist, uh, sort of the animist potential, the animist charge in these stories yeah. going on, uh, where, like, like I have a couple of problems, for instance, with some of the way that Tolkien narrates his stories, uh, and, uh, like, like I, I also remember seeing uh, Robin of Sherwood when I was yeah. a, a kid with Clanet music, and I was yeah. just I was completely blown away by that stuff. Completely blown <laughs> away. But try to watch it today. Try to watch it today. It it it, it doesn't it doesn't age well. <laughs> it was and, very eighty. Then they had blow dryers in Sherwood Forest because they're air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of the 1980s sort of yeah. poodle, poodle heavy hair you know and all that kind of <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, cool um yeah but but and i i think that today some of the stories that you see today are incredibly uh have an incredibly incredible intense animist uh charge like for instance the the as you mentioned that there is a dark aspect of it there is something about it that's dark and scary but that is not a demonic other that just have to be uh eradicated from reality that that particular idea that there is a unambiguously demonic other that just have to die that i think that is a problem it's a serious problem when that becomes the driver in, yeah in uh i think in, that comes from the kind of some of the christian retellings of older stories where characters that were maybe you know pagan deities just got called the devil you know yeah, things like exactly like yeah i think it's Cronos, the the horned god in celtic culture that became the devil and then everywhere in the world there was some pagan entity that actually was more at least ambivalent than evil and they became just the devil, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Where, for instance, like, I think, I think that Harry Potter still has that, that that uh, problem in it. Where a story like uh, it's called uh, Mister Norrell and Jonathan Strange. Are you familiar with that? I don't know this. Uh, I usually check that out. It's it's a kind of an English uh, sort of fantastic uh, story, and it has been made into a TV series. And oh. it it has exactly that feeling of that there is a darkness and there's danger in it, but it is not this demonic other that just has to be sort of uh, uh, thrown out. And it, it's I, I perceived it as very. Uh, connected with the kind of real folklore uh, uh, animacy, actually. 
Interesting. Gosh, yeah. it's really interesting. You're actually, in, this chat is really inspiring me again. As I was saying that those three movies were kind of the first cycle for me. And my next cycle, I'm really interested in exploring um, the connections between Irish people whenever we went out, left the island and went out into the world. The one I'm working on now is about the connection with Native American people, going back to the time of the Irish famine. But then there's also connections in Australia with the Aboriginal people, even in Japan and everywhere in the world. And I find it really interesting to, to look for those commonalities and to yeah look for ways to tell those stories that don't demonize the other or the darkness and to kind of reimagine mm -hmm. it, like you said. Yeah. And it's also like these encounters are also, I think there's something that today narrating these encounter as positive or not that they should be necessarily narrated exclusively as positive exchanges, because of course there are, there's also uh, loads of uh, colonial brutality and all these yeah. kind of things, but nar kind of narrating that there are positive relations between yeah. different peoples and that these positive relations can reflect back into us as majority North Europeans and yeah. allow us to reflect, for instance, on our own cultural background. And it's a, it's a complicated moment for Northern Europeans. I think a lot of Irish people have been retreating into the fact that we were a colony and um, that we, we sort of have that, but we can't completely claim that either because history is more complicated than that. And, you know, even Andrew Jackson, who signed the Indian Removal Act in America, was like... Um, descendant of, of Northern uh, Ulster Scots, you know, so it is, it, it's so, so much more complicated. And so, and it's really, really interesting. And it's our duty as storytellers to not forget the, the nuance, but also to celebrate the stuff that we want to carry forward and, and, and hopefully inspire people with. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Certainly. Let me just see if there's some more questions that i would like to get you wandered around i hope we talk about what you wanted to talk about Ruth. yeah yeah no it's, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely uh, amazing yeah no another example uh that uh i caught i got from exactly this the dark aspect that that is not demonic is the figure in uh, song of the sea uh Mark, Marka, Marka, yeah, yeah, yeah which is portrayed as a harmful or dangerous figure or presents itself but the point of the story is actually creating a, a connectivity or redeeming that figure from its seclusion really there's a, yeah. th that connectivity seems to be the kind of uh, she's kind of like a um, a um you know this kind of person that thinks they're doing good by denying emotions or trying to save people from their emotions by you know, basically turning into stole and will and i will the screenwriter and i talked about a, a kind of a, a slightly dark uh, twist on the irish mammy because maka is nothing like that in irish mythology but she was a mother figure you know her, her the owen maka in the north of ireland is a, a place where she had to run against horses while pregnant and she put a curse on the men of ulster that they'd feel the labor pains that she was feeling and that's the whole story of Cucullin. so just the name we took from there and then the irish word for an owl is a kailakiha which is a barn owl, which is a night witch. So we kind of made this character that kind of symbolized it, the old granny in the story, the kind of the crone or the kailach, you know. The kailach is an interesting, it's kind of a witch, kind of a wise old medicine woman. Again, a character that's become demonized, but actually when you go back to it, she had her place in ancient societies. And um, anyway, so the, the Maka character we hope was redeemed whenever we see that actually she was doing her best to save people from their sadness and grief by turning them to stone or to fear. But actually what she had to do was to let them feel their feelings and herself to feel her own feelings. So we have this fun sequence in the movie where she's going through this kind of um, very short therapy where she all the emotions in the jars are released and she's going through. It was a lot of fun to work on with the actress um, Fanula Flanagan. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I kind of like to try and see, uh, like, what I love about Miyazaki's work, especially something like Princess Mononoke, is the baddies are often flawed humans rather than de devils or demons. You know, they're often people that have their, be like, Lady of Boshi is, like, trying to save all the people in Iron Town. They're all sex workers and lepers and people that are outcasts from the rest of society. But what she's doing with Iron Town is destroying the forest and the spirits are in rebellion against her. And I loved how nuanced she was as a, as a villain, you know. And so 
maybe someday I'll be able to make something as as nuanced as Princess Mononoke. But that's kind of the gold standard, I think, yeah. for baddies, you know. Uh, Princess Mononoke is an absolutely wonderful movie yeah. uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I really love Miyazaki. Do you, do you uh, do you see a, a like a similarities between the the this animist reality that that you see in Miyazaki's work and uh and the kind of animism that you are communicating in for instance Song of the Sea yeah, and, yeah. my uh, my journey my spiritual journey I mean obviously I was raised Catholic and then I became very um disillusioned with the church and all the atrocities that they'd committed in the 20th century in Ireland and I moved away from the church and I had a kind of loss of faith and it was kind of disturbing me And so I found my way back through Buddhism and Taoism and these kind of Eastern religions. And that's when I discovered this idea of Japanese animism, which coincided with my professional life where I was realizing that that's what Miyazaki had been speaking to. And then that led me back during the early days of Secret of Kells to um, seeing similar things and what I was learning from that way of looking at the world, that Eastern spirituality, seeing similar stuff in my own heritage or you know in Irish culture and heritage and stuff like that so yeah for sure that was part of a journey in my early 20s like yeah. away from a slightly oppressive um spirituality that I had in the Catholic Church towards something more um yeah m- more like what we've been talking about yeah and and uh and today when you, uh, you're working with uh, Choctaw uh, uh the Choctaw Irish uh encounter uh Are you then? Are you're working then with with Choctaw uh, writers or film? Yeah, uh, so people. So, um, Waylon White Deer is a Choctaw guy who lived in Ireland for eight or nine years, and he was a big part of uh, reminding us of the connection when the Choctaw sent aid to Ireland during the famine, and um, and he he's been really instrumental. Like he's a professor of Choctaw um, culture in University of Oklahoma. Um, working with Shelley Dennis, who's a Choctaw writer from Spirit Rangers. She's working with Will Collins and me on the script. And Bird Running Water, who's from Oklahoma. He's not Choctaw, but he's a exec producer. So yeah, we're trying to look to to those. Um, yeah, again, it's it's really fat. One of the first things that fascinated me about Choctaw belief. Um, Waylon doesn't like to call it folklore, and I try to respect that because they were they are beliefs, you know. But um, they have little people, you know, that lead <coughs> children into the forest and teach them medicine and then become an elixir, like a medicine person or a shaman. And um, and those are in Irish culture. They became like the leprechauns and the silly stuff of the um, 1800s when the English were kind of mocking us by by with those kind of caricatures. But prior to that, the fairies, the little people were a very real part of the Irish belief system. And maybe for some older people still today. But I found that amazing that that was also in Choctaw culture. So I can imagine how those first encounters, those stories and those beliefs between those two cultures, would have, they would have been surprised by that. And, and you know, the movie's called Kindred Spirits because Waylon wrote a poem about the connection between the Choctaw and the Irish that called us kindred spirits. And we're exploring so many different um aspects it's hard to believe really i mean these are people who had i think 12,000 years of history in the mississippi before they were forcibly removed from their land and sent to oklahoma 150 years ago and similarly irish culture you know before everyone was moved off the east and pushed into the west very very similar uh, story and so that commonality is relatively recent history but going way back the old um you know beliefs and stories and stuff to have so much commonality as well which is really fascinating when i was in oklahoma in the in the choctaw cultural center they had an exhibition when i was there and it's hard to believe when you're in the middle of the plains and prairies of the american midwest that there's any connection with a little cold rainy island you know and yet they had an exhibition of different artists and also you know lots of different tribes because there's become this melting pot in oklahoma You know, there's a connection between Cherokee and Scottish. Um, as I said, the Mohawk in Canada were also very um, connected to the Irish, the Ojibwe people. Um, so a lot, a lot of connections. And, and in this exhibition, they were showing that were were people of you know clans and tribes and families and ways of seeing the world that were in common. And I just thought it was so interesting that that was being celebrated here 
there in, in, in the American Midwest. And most people in Ireland would be shocked if they actually heard about this yeah. connection. You know, they, they can't believe it, but yeah. there it is. Oh, that's that, it's super fascinating. Super yeah. fascinating. The, yeah, uh, I've heard about a, a Scandinavian indigenous American interface. They, I think they sometimes call them Findians, <laughs> uh, which, uh, uh, which, which is like in particularly in Minnesota, but also I think, ah, in yes. and, uh, like for instance, uh, Finnish people from Scandinavia have traditions of sauna, uh, ah, yeah. which is actually like it's a very animist yeah. practice, and it is very uh, aligned with or easily aligned with uh, sweat lodge practices of indigenous groups in America. It's interesting, right? And I guess uh, there are these sort of kind of yeah, connections yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting to look at and to see. And culture is alive and always changing. It's not. It's not like um, locked in one way, the influence in each other. And even even see that amongst the Native American people in Oklahoma, where their powwows often borrow from, like Plains Indian garb becomes part of the Choctaw powwow, even though they weren't Plains Indians and didn't have these elaborate war bonnets and stuff. They start to bring some of that in because culture is always intermingling and, and mixing up. And yeah. You see it in Ireland, like living traditions like Irish dancing and Irish music being reinterpreted with instruments that are international or even modern electronic music. And I think that's really important. As much as it's important to preserve the traditional stuff, it's like language. If it's alive, it's always borrowing and taking and, and bringing, mixing up and everything. I think that's really interesting, you know. Exactly. Like, amen, amen. <laughs> like the, 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 I think basically this is an animist point apply to culture in the same way as we as humans we 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 stay alive or live or our world dies if we fall out of relation with those seal women in in the sea <laughs> yeah. and with all these different beings around yeah. us in the same way human culture in order to stay alive it has it has to actually be interconnected with mm. other human culture and mm. i think actually uh like particularly uh nationalism as a, as a kind of an ideological construct has a tendency to to see human culture as as mm -hmm. kind of dependent on being enclosed in these mm -hmm. these kind of walls as if it's inside a container and yeah. then uh whereas uh in actual fact human uh human culture is uh, like marrying like marrying seals uh, or even just in Secret of Kells, you know, this idea of this wall reminds me of somebody we know in recent history thinking a wall was a good idea. You know, the abbot is building a wall around the Kells to keep the world out. And it was sadly just trapping themselves rather than freeing themselves. And, yeah. 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 There's an Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal Australian thinker that I reference a lot at the moment called Tyson Juncker Porter. Um, mm. And he talks about these two different categories of understanding well the world and humanity as uh, entropically enclosed or related, and and that thing about being entropic, entropic or enclosed like that is very characteristic of uh, Western civilization, the urbanized consumer civilization, and it's part of the reason that we have lost contact with uh, with the world around us, and we and and that. It's dying. You could compare it actually with the image you you uh, uh, have in in uh, the Song of the Sea again, uh, where ma the Maka is, is she's catching these emotions and locking them into, into yeah. uh, and we all know that you know an emotion doesn't work like that. An emotion is a relational thing. It's mm -hmm. that's where it flows from. You know, it's mm -hmm. not an in uh, kind of uh, yeah, and even dance and ritual is often a somatic way of expressing trauma and everything in the community. And those kind of powwows or whatever get to it getters, you know, they have a kind of a, an emotional release built into them, you know, that they're important. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Great. Um Thank you very, very much for, uh, for taking the time to talk to me. This was uh, hyper interesting and I'm really yeah, happy. I hope we can, to... Honestly, I hope we can talk again soon. I feel like uh, there's lights in my brain lighting up with ideas as I talk to you. So I, I feel like it's productive for us to chat again, you know, even 
off off camera or whatever, you know. Um, I, I think there's a lot, lot more we can share. Yeah, I'm sure. Totally, but... totally. Let's ping pong. Let's ping pong ideas. I'm totally up for it. That would so, be awesome. uh, uh, And to everybody out there, Tom Moore, a great storyteller of our time. <clears throat> if you didn't do your homework and watch his movie before watching this interview, then go and do it now. <laughs> thank and you. Uh, thank you very much for Thanks, uh, for coming here. Scurvy and a typical condo